if you don't have core skills that you are offering, then you this is not the company for you to found, right? You have to make sure that there's also a fit between the the product that you're creating and uh, and you as a founder. All right, Alexandra, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, nice to be here. Yeah, so you're a lawyer and advisor, former SEC founder, and uh, a best-selling author. But uh, for any listeners that aren't familiar with you, why don't you give a little bit uh, about yourself? Sure. Um, So yeah, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I used to work at the SEC in a great big firm called Mayor Brown. Um, I uh, headed a practice, then had my own. I founded two companies. I've exited, moved into blockchain 2016. Um, been here since then. Um, I've actually been working with these two other technologies, um, AI and quantum computing, way before they were cool, because they're all actually combining with blockchain in our own little singularity. So um, I advise companies. Um, I have like an exchange and some banks and a bunch of uh, Web3 projects. And um, I just have a I consult mostly. I just uh, uh, I help companies uh, do a bunch of different things, but mostly I'm a I'm a problem solver. So I I help. There's a, I don't really have a great description because I kind of uh, fell into the business that I'm in, <laughs> but um, really I just help uh, I, I help clients do whatever it is that they need to get done. So they want to do something and they can't figure out how to do it, or they come into a problem. I help them fix it. And that's usually what I do. Sometimes they don't know the correct problem, like they have the wrong problem. And so I tell them how to identify the right problem and then get them on the right path. And they have like regulatory issues. We deal with those. Or sometimes it's that they don't know how to set up tokenomic systems or the proper program for whatever it is that they're doing. So it just varies a lot, which is really fun. And I love working with founders a lot. They're like kind of amazing, magical people. So it's really cool. And uh, I wrote a book on DeFi uh, because a publisher, O'Reilly, came to me and asked me to write it. um, And I didn't know how much work it was. So I was like, sure. (laughs) I had no idea. Uh, You know, ignorance is ignorance is not just bliss. It's what makes people agree to things. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, so I agreed to do it because of that. And, um, uh, it came out in March. It's been doing really well. Uh, it's called understanding DeFi and it talks about what blockchain is and what, what finance is, which anybody who wants to have generational wealth has to understand what finance is. You have to understand financial tools and then how those two get together in decentralized finance how to build and operate in DeFi as it is right now. And then what the future is for that space, which I think is really important because it's nothing like what we're dealing with right now. It's really about how people are going to be able to use assets to finance everything from businesses to homes to anything that they want. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, I I have to point out, I hate answering the question. uh, Tell me a little bit about yourself. So I, I kind of cringe that I have to ask people that all the time. Um, and put them in that position. <laughs> so I never know what to say. So yeah, yeah, same here. Um, you mentioned I'm not too familiar with the world of the SEC. So you mentioned uh, you work for a firm. So is that how the SEC is structured? You work? No, no. Um, so I worked at the SEC. It's a government agency. Yeah, and yeah. then afterwards, I worked at a at a law firm. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one question I wanted to ask you right off the bat is. Uh, Being in the crypto world, I've been uh, in crypto since 2017. If you watch any crypto videos on YouTube or anything like that, you always hear the line, this is not financial advice, followed by a bunch of financial advice. So I just have to ask a a lawyer, are they really protecting themselves by doing that? Or is it just uh, a habit or a, a routine at this point? I mean, not really, you know, it depends on the type of what they say. It really depends on what they say. It's not really like, that's not a catch all, you know, curative, like, um, this is not financial advice. Let me give you all sorts of financial advice, or this is not legal advice. Let me give you all sorts of legal advice. It doesn't really work that way. Right. It's really about 
what you say? Is it general or specific in nature? Is it telling you, uh, I don't know why you wouldn't buy this, you know, and then and then talking about how wonderful something is, you know, but then saying this isn't financial advice that doesn't really save you. Right. It's not like um, it's not like a confession. Right. (laughs) You don't just say the words and then suddenly like all done. (laughs) So. Um, you know, I think that there's just a lot of misconceptions in the space altogether. And that just happens to be one of them. Yeah, I, I, I watched one video uh, and he was, he was a larger account and he, he said, this is not financial advice, but you should buy this. And I'm like, I don't <laughs> think you have the protection. <laughs> <lot> of financial <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, why don't you tell people a little bit about what what DeFi is, um, why should people care about DeFi? And uh, I mean, a lot of, a, a very small percentage of people are actually into the crypto world, into DeFi. So why should people that aren't in DeFi care about what's going on? So, um, okay, so a lot of people aren't even in crypto, right? So uh, it's one of the areas I work in, crypto, and um And a lot of people aren't in it and they think about it as just tokens, but that's not really what blockchain is, right? Blockchain is a technology that has like three main use cases and it has a huge benefit. And at the end of the day, what's going to happen with blockchain? Blockchain has to be accepted overall by the rest of industry, which we're seeing happen, right? Most of this is being driven by industry and institutions and uh, and what's going to happen really is transactions are going to be done by a mix of decentralized and decentralized um, backends, right? So a transaction, you're going to like say, uh, I want to send uh, X amount of money to Y person from my account. And you don't want, like, there's nothing that says that you want that person to know your, what your account is. You don't want their you know, wallet or bank to know what your account is or even your identity, right? But you want the assets transferred and you need to make sure that the title and everything else is transferred. So what's going to happen is you're going to enter that into your account or your whatever the app is that you have. And then behind the scenes, that's going to be split apart into two different sections. One's going to go to decentralized uh, applications, which will deal with basically your identity and other things that that are best done on on blockchain. And then the other part is going to go on centralized stuff, which is going to deal with making sure the transaction closes quickly and and that the assets uh, actually change hands, right? So that's going to happen. There's going to be basically a splitting apart. It's going to come back together. And on your end, on your end, you're basically just going to see transaction complete, right? So really, it's just another backend transaction machinery, right? That's all it is. And people treat it like it's this, you know, it's not a scam, it's whatever. But it's like, think about the internet. The internet, like people use e-commerce and have stores, right? You use both. It's not one or the other, right? They're not, it's not mutually exclusive. You can have both of these things. We have to remember that that tokens are just a part of a technology. And then um, with respect to the investing part of it, you know, there's, some stuff that needs to be changed from the part of the um, the industry and some stuff that just needs a huge amount of revamping from the government standpoint. That's There's just both sides have issues. So, yeah. you know, for that. So first, you know, we have like people have to accept that blockchain exists independent of tokens. When it comes to DeFi, DeFi is actually the most natural Uh, offshoot of what started blockchain in the first place, which was the banking crisis of uh, 2008, right? Which is, you know, this idea that banks are not fair institutions. We've known this for such a long time. Banks get special treatment. Banks are not fair. They give you only a percentage of the value of any collateral they require, but they take ownership of the collateral. Like, you know, when you have a house, right? And your house is collateral for your mortgage. They hold the title, right? For, you know, like they hold, like the the bank holds title to your car when you have a car loan and stuff like that. So they own your collateral, even when you only get like a portion of the value in a loan, right? You have to put a down payment or something like that. Um, Or if you want to use collateral for a loan, they'll give you 20 to 40% of the value of that, of that item 
for your for a loan. They'll loan you 20 to 40 percent of that the value of that collateral, and they'll still require you to have title to that uh, or require holding title to that loan. So, um, I mean, there's they they require a lot and give a little. On on top of that, we already know that if uh, two houses that are identical in a, like a, a segment of of suburbia, right? They're built by the same developer the same year. They're basically identical houses on two different lots that are right next to each other. And one is owned by a white family and one's owned by a black family. The white family will have a higher appraisal value than the black family that's been shown repeatedly, right? Uh, banks care about uh, your education and uh, where you live, where your parents lived, like how much you know income you have. They care about things that don't pertain to the transaction at hand. So there's a lot of fundamental unfairness with banks. And that is one of the reasons why Bitcoin was invented was to circumvent banks. It used banking technology to to initially circumvent banks. So when we think about finance, finance is just money making money. So if we started with, can we transact value between one another without a bank. That's the first part of it. Now, can we not just transact value, but can can I have value? Can I have something of value and have that increase in value? Can the thing that I hold in value, can it increase in value without a bank, right? So can my money, can my, the, the thing that I use to uh, buy assets, right? And what I get when I sell assets. Can I make that a tool to earn more money, right? Can I, can I use my money as a tool? That's what banks do. Banks make money with your money, right? They take the deposits and they put them in investment tools and then they charge you for the money that you use. Uh, for the money you you deposited, yeah. they're using your money, and then they take your they they charge you for that use, and you don't get the benefit of the money that you put in to their tool, right? They just give you your money back. They don't actually give you the interest, which is the benefit that you get from investing that money. They don't give you that at all. Like so, so if we think about lending money like a truck, right? When you loan out a truck. You have to charge a rental rate. And uh, if the money is the truck, the rental rate is interest. And you get more interest if the person is renting it out for a long time or they have a really bad driving record, right? You know it's gonna, it's probably gonna come back trashed. Then you have to charge them more money. But if they're taking it for a very short time or they're super safe, then you charge them less interest, right? Because there's less risk. So you have to get the money back, right? You have to get your truck back. Plus, you get a cost because you couldn't use your truck while they were using it. That's how interest works. That's how money is an investment tool. So what banks do is they take everyone's deposits, not their money. They take your money and they invest it in things like mortgages and stuff like that, right? They loan it out to other people and money comes back, not just the money that they loaned, but also interest. And they take all of that interest and they keep it. That's their profit. And they return to you the money that you deposited. And if you ever paid anything for your, a bank account, like you paid a wire fee or an ATM fee or anything like that, you just paid for them to make money on your, uh, on your account. Like for, you paid for them to make money from your money, which is an insane thing to me. So most of the, what goes on with banks to me seems like it is all uh, against the depositor. So the reason DeFi is actually something that's a natural offshoot is it's basically you get the benefit of your money being a financial tool, right? Your money is going out into something. It's it's creating something. It's 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 fueling the engine of something else. And it's earning interest in that process. And you get the interest back for it, right? If yeah. you're going without your money, then you're getting interest back for it. You're getting paid for your money to go out into the world and do work, just like anybody else who does work. It should be paid. But the problem that we have right now with DeFi is that a lot of DeFi doesn't do anything and people don't understand finance. So they'll say, 
lock your your uh, tokens up or something, right? You buy yeah. tokens. Tokens represent value that you can cash out. You b- buy your tokens, lock them up, and uh, and they'll come back with some return. Well, how does that work, right? Have you ever put money in a piggy bank or a box under the bed and ended up with more money? It doesn't work. No. There's no money sex. If that if they did, that'd be pretty cool, right? But there's no money sex. You don't get baby money that way. Like there's no there's no way to create new money for yourself without the money going out into the world. It has to fund something, right? It has to fund businesses. It has to fund, you know, someone a payment for something so that someone else now repays you with interest. And what we've seen are a bunch of these applications that are being made where the money doesn't do anything. No. That is why so many of them are cons. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of scams in the crypto space right now. How do people navigate it and find what's not a scam and what is actually providing some utility and an and investment vehicle? You have to ask, you have to find out. I mean, you have to find out, like this is the part where the industry has to change. The industry has to be more forthcoming with what the hell they're doing, right? They have to say, they have to be more transparent. They're not, a lot of uh, uh, applications and stuff, they're just not transparent. So they have to say, you know, like I'm, uh, what's happening with your money? Um, Like for example, there's one chain that says, we're investing with banks and we're getting a better rate. How is a bank going to give you a better rate or a better, which means a better return on investment than they get. Nobody would do that. Who's going to say, you know what, if you come in on this deal with me, I'll give you 70% of the take on this deal, right? That that means that either you gave the the bulk of it or you were the one that made the deal. Nobody Hmm. else would do that, right? So if someone says, uh, I'm in, I'm go- we're going in on a bank deal and we're getting a better return than the banks. Does that make sense to you? Look at what bank returns are getting. So if a bank is, um, is giving you, uh, you know, 3% and you're getting 7% returns, how are you getting that additional money? What is that from? Right. What are they doing? Who's paying for that? Cause somebody has to pay for that, right? It's not magical. So somebody has to pay for that. Somebody, they have to be getting that money from something and having to pay for it. If it's because they're investing money and that money is in a return, well, then you're actually in a fund. You're not actually in a financial tool. You're in a fund. That's where people pool their money, invest together in something where they're investing in different things with different amounts of risk. And then, you know, the, the returns on investment are what you're getting. That's not a financial tool. That's not a DeFi thing, right? That's not a financial tool. That is an equity tool. That's where you're investing in things. And if you're investing in things like that, then you have to find out what is the risk of all of these investments? How, what is their investment strategy? How are they doing it? Are they hedging their strategy? Are they managing their risk? Who is doing it, right? Yeah. So all of these things are things that people need to ask. This is where I'm not against retail investors at all. I love retail investors being in the space, but they need to know what questions to ask. And the people who are offering these products need to be willing to offer the information, even if they're not asked, right? That's what the disclosure system is, is this is what we're doing with the money. And if we're lying, we're liable. That's what, that's what the whole disclosure system is. That's what the industry fights so hard. That part, I think we shouldn't be fighting, right? We should be wanting, like, we have an obligation because we're not dealing with professional investors. We're dealing with non-professional investors. So we have a more of an obligation to be honest and forthcoming and explain things. So we need to explain this is how we make money and this is how you will make money. And here's where the risk is, right? And if you don't, if you're not comfortable with this, you know, then this is not the risk level for you. You should find something safer. But um, just saying, well, if you lose money, that's on you. That is not the right attitude, right? That's not the right attitude because that means that's basically putting the con on the, um, on the, the investors, Investors have the right to ask. Once they understand the risk, then it's on them. 
But if you're not telling them the risk or you're hiding the risk or you're telling them this is a sure thing, which a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of apps are, um, then then it's on you. Right. Because you're not actually disclosing anything. Where do they go to get the information? They still need to have some place to get the information. There's no way to make a reasonable investment without actually figuring this stuff out. So anyway, are are there specific DeFi projects that you've found personally impressive or, or leading the way? I don't talk about specific investments ever. Um, and okay. I don't talk about what I invest in. Yeah. I do talk about um, like things that I like. And uh, actually in my book, right, um, there's a whole list of things that you should look for in projects. I'm not going to tell you which projects you should invest in. I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm not going to yeah. do that. And more than that, I don't know anyone's specific risk profile. You need to know yeah. the specifics about someone's risk profile. Something could be a great investment for me and a terrible investment for you, and we could both be right. The idea that something's a great investment for everyone is stupid, right? So this idea of like, everybody get into this. This is a terrible idea, right? Uh, you don't know whether or not that fit meets, meets their risk profile or their resources or whatever, right? This is a terrible idea. So uh, so I, I I don't know that I'm not engaged in the service of doing that for someone. So all I can say is here are criteria that I look for, and here are things that you know I have I have collected from a group of people who are uh, very skilled at looking for things, and here are things that they've looked for, and so here are things that I would suggest you start with. I've done entire spaces on how to DYOR, right? Because I hate that we say do your own research. And so many people don't actually go deeper into saying, what does that even mean? Like, what is do yeah. your own research? <laughs> like, yeah. how do I do my own research? Right. I just like, I'm a teacher. How do I do my own research in, you know, in crypto? What does that even mean? Like, so um, I've done like spaces on that before of like saying like, this is what do your own research means. This is what you're looking for. Here's the things that are good and here are the things that are bad. So that's the kind of information I give. Yeah, I I don't consider myself an expert in anything, but I'll I'll talk crypto with people, and uh, I I've known a lot of people into meme coins, which I kind of have a disdain for, and uh, you know I'll, I'll I'll tell people at least go to the website. At the very least, you should be going to these projects' websites and seeing what they're actually doing, because some of them you can go to the website and see, yeah, this isn't anything. It's just a pump and dump scheme. Like they just want more people investing so eventually the the original people can get out and and empty their bags on you. And yeah, do you have any thoughts on meme coins cuz I I think they're bad for the industry in general because most of them are just pump and dump schemes and I don't. I mean, I don't I don't hate them. I think they're community builders and mm. uh they pump liquidity into systems. Yeah. So, um I think every like every system has a bunch of different parts that it needs, right? It, it's not all about having like just thoughtful investors. No system has that, not stocks, not bonds, not, you know, there's no system that's just all like reasonable, thoughtful investors, which is mm -hmm. why markets are unpredictable, right? Because markets don't have perfect information. Markets don't have, um, you know, perfectly reasonable investors. Markets have a mix of people. And, and honestly, that mix of people is a healthy thing, right? So um, there is a big group of people uh, that should should only be, I think, I think maybe the percentage of the crypto population that is in meme coins and in what we call DGen activity is higher than than we would want in a mature uh, population, right? In a mature crypto population. But at the same time, that's what you get in new systems, right? Think of like the Old West, right? Yeah. When the Old West was settled, it wasn't a bunch of very civilized people that came in and were like, we're going to have tea at four. Uh, all the kids are going to be in school. Uh, no one should be dirty in the streets. You know, everything has to be completely paid because things take time to progress. So the the first people in are people who don't mind rough edges and uh, dirty places. 
And that is every system. And that was stock when stock started. That is, that was, you know, debt. That's, uh, you know, crypto. That was the internet for sure. You know, yeah. everything starts off with people that are like profiteers and people who like lawlessness, but also people who like freedom, people who are, they just want to make rules where there aren't any. They, they're, there's just a group of people that do that. And in crypto, we call them DGENs, right? Now, eventually, that group of people is going to be pushed out or pushed to the rims of this industry, right? That group of people, uh, as the system grows and becomes more mainstream, they're going to become more of the fringe. They're going to become essentially what we think of as like uh, the day traders of um, of the stock market or whatever. They're going to become the, this group that exists that people know about, but they're not going to be the driving force of anything. They're not going to be the trendsetters of anything, and they're not going to be the people that are driving the conversation. They're just going to be their own group of people, but they're also the people that you know, makes, they make this system work right now, right? They're, they're, they keep interest moving. They keep money moving in the system. They keep uh, other countries involved. They move money through systems, through various systems from one to another. So, you know, in a lot of ways, every new established system owes their existence to people like that. So, I don't hate them just because I don't participate in it very much. Like I've only been part of one meme coin community ever and yeah. uh, just to see what it was like. And I'm not a meme coin person. Like I'm not a high risk kind of person, right? Even though I've run companies, like I like things where I control the risk entirely. And, and you don't do that in a meme coin community, but the people in these communities and in the DGen communities, they're, they're a type of person that is, um, it's it's extremely relevant to this community and and this type of person is literally at the leading edge of like every other you know new technology or community this is i mean i just they were the people who started ebay they were the people like everybody and everybody forgets about them as the technology becomes more mainstream but they're the ones that are kind of the bellwethers so no i don't hate meme coins i just see them as like the plaything of the community that is driving this right now and eventually you know they're probably going to become a kid thing honestly like kids will be playing with these things and they'll become like penny value and they'll become like basically our penny stocks is going to meme coins are going to be our penny stocks and that's okay there's nothing wrong with that right there's that's okay but uh, I'm not going to like, you know, crap on the meme coins of today because I appreciate the people that are in it right now. Yeah, that's a really cool outlook. Maybe maybe it's not me hating meme coins so much as uh, maybe being a little bit more eager for that later time period when there are a smaller I know, portion of I know, of it. I know. It's like, why aren't we there yet? But when you think about it, it hasn't even like, it hasn't even been 20 years, you know, yeah. since it took like 60 for us to figure, it took 50 for us to figure out like that you could monetize the internet and like 60 for us to figure out how monetization was smoothly so everybody could do it on yeah. the internet. It's not even been 20 and we're, we're monetizing already, right? So it's kind of like the expectation, it's because we want everything like instantly, instant, like instant gratification takes too long, you know, like we want everything now. And so it feels very slow, but really the pace of blockchain is incredibly fast. So yeah. we're getting there. We're, we're getting there very quickly. Yeah. One of the things that I, I do have a very big disdain for is scams. I, 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 they're bad for the people who get scammed and they're bad for the crypto industry in general because it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth and they might turn away from crypto completely instead of realizing that there are good projects, there are just a lot of scams out there too. What is your advice for finding what's a scam and avoiding them? Like how do you how do you recognize a scam when it's in front of you? Yeah, I haven't actually had a problem like knock on wood. 
Um, but I haven't had a problem finding the scams. I've actually called every major scam uh, over the last, oh, three plus years. And uh, every um, every bank failure in order. Uh, and I don't think that they're hiding for the most part. I think that scams, like, you know what they say, like, it takes two to tango or whatever. Yeah. It, it's really about people wanting to be scammed. And in some ways, it's people being greedy. The part that I don't like about scams, especially because of the people who invest in the space, is that a lot of the scams find a foothold because people are desperate. Hmm. That is the part that I have such an issue with, right? Like, look, there are a lot of people out there that are getting scammed about a lot of different things because they are greedy as hell. And you know what? That gets you where it gets you, right? Like, look, you know, you got to know you're in the world the way we are. And so whatever happens, happens. But there are people who are desperate and looking for anything. And um, and the way that the Fed and the like ec economists view the economy is very different from the way most people experience the economy, if that makes sense. So the like right now, um, I think Powell just issued a statement say, about stagflation saying, I don't see the stag or the flation right now. You know, it's looking great. Um, and uh, but um, and, and the jobs report is just saying like, you know, oh, my God, the market's so tight. But that's based on the employer side, not the em employee side. Right. Yeah. So a lot of people have been losing jobs because we've been losing industries for a long time. And that is the nature of technology. Technology and the progress of technology has always uh, replaced more people than uh, like re replaced people with machinery, right? More people get uh, moved out of uh, employment than into employment. There's this idea like that, no, more people will get new jobs or whatever. No, people will have jobs. New people will be required, but fewer people. Like, um, you know, a bulldozer replaced 50 people physically having to dig, right? Um, and uh, looms replaced a bunch of different people having to hand weave, right? Um, and that you have a bunch of like, this is like a, a computer replaced a bunch of individual people having to do all those different parts of equations St and, you know, steno pools and stuff like that. So the, the truth is that um, that is the nature of technology, is technology replaces human labor. Yeah. And we've been moving in that direction for, you know, hundreds of years, if not longer, right? That's the whole point, is that we're replacing human labor. So the idea that it's not taking your jobs, yeah, it is. That's the point, is it's taking the jobs, which isn't a problem, as long as the people who don't have jobs anymore have a way to earn a living. That is the problem, is that the the people who are driving the economy are not looking at they're looking at the economy as a whole but they're not really looking at the experiences of the people who are losing their jobs and can't get more and it's like well you know you can't make an omelet without ba breaking a few eggs kind of thing no. but the problem is for those people who are left well, you know like yes oh it sucks that you don't have a job right now but look at all the new things that are being built and there's new jobs well but there's whole generations of people that now are being left out of economic growth so uh what does that mean that means you've got a lot of people who are desperate because there's no plan yeah. There's never been a plan. We've not ever had an economic model that has a plan for the attrition of human labor. And I don't understand why we need a new economic model, but we don't have a model. We've never considered what the actual human value is of or like what the human cost is of the um, of those that attrition. So um, what you end up ha having is a bunch of people that are moving into uh, a very scary, desperate time because there aren't jobs that support that person and whatever responsibility load that they have. And so they see people saying, make money here. They've heard that other people have made a lot of money in crypto in some method. And then what do they do? That's what they want. Like they're, they're desperate. It's not, 
that they're greedy. It's a lifeline, right? So they're just desperately clinging to lifelines. So that that is what I have a problem with because that is basically just opportunistic. So when you're looking for like for those people, you know, I try really hard to offer a lot of information about what constitutes scams and where they're likely like, you know, like a like big clout, you know, where uh, all the money goes into one wallet that's held by the founder, <laughs> you know, or uh, you can't get out of it or, um, you know, an improper use of a bonding curve or um, or the fact that, you know, you don't know how money is being made, right? Your money is trapped, it, you're put into some system and you don't know how money is being made or uh, the money valuation is dependent on something that doesn't make sense. Like, um, you're like, they're supposed to be somehow humans are supposed to uh, rationally rebalance something. That's not how humans work, right? That like, that's the whole problem with like these algorithmic coins and stuff. And that's why I told people for ages about Terra Luna, right? Because yeah. the idea was people who held a coin that was losing value would then do something to shore up the value. That's not how people operate. They see something is losing value. They want to get out as quickly as possible. That is what happened, right? So yeah. um, there's this misunderstanding of the irrationality and group mentality of people. And, um, and you have to understand what the mechanisms are of anything that you invest in. What makes it make money and where is the risk? If you can't identify those, then don't go into it because something's being hidden from you. You you mentioned the desperation, which I agree. That's a big part of uh, scams and why they work and also greed, of course. But the, the desperation is a little bit concerning because we have AI replacing so many jobs and there it seems like there are going to be fewer and fewer industries for human beings to occupy. Although that could change, like we could see a something open up. But does that mean that we're going to likely see more scams, in your opinion? I think so. I mean, I think over time, um, you know, scams do seem to multiply. I don't ever see a time when there's not going to be scams. Like the yeah. idea that scams won't exist. Um, I mean, I just don't buy it. Yeah. Do I think that there's going to be a time where, you know, everything's properly labeled? I don't think that either. I mean, I think that there's always going to be this issue where, you know, marketing meets opportunism. <laughs> you yeah. know? And, and, you know, th people make bad decisions. Sometimes they make bad decisions even after doing their best research. And sometimes people make bad decisions because they can't do research. You know, you can't protect people from bad decisions, but you can require research. Like you can require, like you can't require people to do research, but you can require companies to make information available. You like, that's actually the disclosure system now that this, that most companies are under, which is they're not telling you what to do. As long as it's not illegal, it doesn't matter. They're not telling you what to do. You just have to say what you're doing and don't lie about anything and don't t leave out anything that's important to the company. You just can't. And that's where your liability is. And that's really like, no, there's no requirement to read that information. There's no uh, requirement to understand it. There's just the requirement to disclose it, right? That's it. Yeah. And I think that's actually reasonable. You can't make people read stuff. You can't make people do appropriate amounts of research. Nobody knows what appropriate is, right? You can't make people, um, you know, care about the, you know, the potential consequences and risk. Not everybody understands it, right? And you can't, you can't parent people with their money. That's just... Uh, that is a level of oversight that I don't know that any state actually uh, has undertaken because people can freely spend money, right? If you want economies to work, people have to be free to spend their money however they want. But I do think you just have to make information available. And look, if the information says, we plan on taking your money 
you will never get it back and you will never get any value for this, which there have been coins that have done. They've said it. This is never going to mean anything. This will never do anything. And people pour money into it. They have no cause of action. Like people don't understand that disclosure protects them. Like the companies, they protect the companies. Right. You can't sue. Like it, they told you this is what, what they're doing. They're taking your money. This is basically a fun ride for you, right? This is the cost of admission. You get to pay your money and then you get to be part of whatever the hell you think this is and you will never get anything back for it and they are going to be away at Malta. And that's it. That's yeah. what this is. And that's it. And that's there's nothing wrong with that, actually. There's nothing wrong with that. They can go as long as they're telling everybody we're going to be doing this. That's fine. I remember when I was at the SEC, like what? Like I had this company that was like, we are going to be buying or we're going to be selling below cost for the foreseeable future. They will be selling their products below the price at which they buy them for the foreseeable future. There's no way to make money doing that. They blew out their ice, their uh, IPO. Like they, they oversold it. <laughs> I was like, what are people doing? And it went like, whoop, and then it went, whoop, oh <laughs> and it, it completely crashed. And all the people who bought it, I was like, what were you thinking? But there's no recourse because they told them like, you can't, like, there's no path to money when you do that. But, it, but they said it, there's yeah. no path to money here, but okay. Anyway. What, it, what's something about the SEC or, or things about the SEC that, you feel most people don't understand. I mean, the SEC is not touching too many people's lives as far as they can see in their everyday lives, but it does. If you're into stocks, if you're into crypto, it is. But I, we have this kind of, you know, we see Gary Gensler. That's about all most people know about the SEC. So what do most people not understand in your view? It's really weird because most people never knew who the... um the commissioner of the SEC was. So it's very weird that anybody even knows who it is now, right? Because for years, um, nobody ever knew who it was. And um, like outside of the SEC or maybe even inside the SEC, right? Um, the thing is like inside the SEC, like it's so funny. People think that the commissioner is like this person who walks around and observes everything. And the truth is that the commissioner... Um, like, you never see the commissioners, right? You never see, like, that level in your daily life, right? At, when you're working there in your, like, traditional grunt, you know, role of accountant or attorney, which is what I was, you know, uh, that you don't, that you don't interact with them. You don't, right. in, like, they're not in your face. They're not telling you what to do every day. That, that's just not how it works. Um, I remember I loved the floor that they were on because I would always go to the bathroom there because no one was ever in there. <laughs> I was like, that was the best place to go. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, so I guess it's a really flat organization, but you don't see like the, the, the commissioner's are more external than internal. So thinking like they're telling everybody about, you know, the, the reviews and things like that and what to say and do, that's really not happening. Everybody's pretty autonomous there. Nobody's really getting a lot of like their hand held or whatever. The attorneys and, and the accountants work together, but there's not a ton of like, you don't need a lot of oversight. Most of the people there uh, when I was there, at least, most of the workers, like every organization, right? There is a difference between the people who are running the organization and um, the people who are in the organization, right? It's just like the difference between the government and the citizenry. Mm -hmm. The people who are in there are like not political. <laughs> They're normal everyday people just want to work and go home they're not out to overthrow anything or anybody they're not against or for anything they're just trying to get the job done and you know like not get anybody mad at them you know most of them come in on the weekends to do work because there's so much work uh, and they don't get paid extra for it I did it all the time and 
Um, I guess like, it's just, it's not what you think it is. It's not a bunch of people who are out there to destroy, you know, commerce. It's mostly a bunch of people who are out there trying to help people. And, you know, it's just very different. Like the, the administration of these agencies is very different from the workers in the, in the agencies. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I just, I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't see most of the uh, people who were, who were overseeing the administration. So. Yeah. It seems like at the head of a lot of departments and government, you have the, the, the department and it's mostly people just doing their jobs, but then at the heads, you, you typically have a politician or a few politicians that are really, they're the, the political liaison that kind of deals with the political apparatus. And yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just not like that. I mean, it's like, I mean, like, like, I mean, the Iranian government is like, you know, one of our, like the taboo governments, you know, we're like enemies, they hate us or whatever. But like the Iranian people, like the Persian society, nicest people ever, yeah, warm, yeah. wonderful, great food, you know, like great food. I mean, like it's completely, it's, they're not the same. Like we just can't conflate these two things. It's not the same, you know, the people who are the political arm of things is usually not the same thing as the people who are just like, it's my job, man. We're not KGB. <laughs> we're yeah. not CIA. We're not trying to carry out like we're just look, I, I see the rules. I'm trying to, you know, do what the rules say. That's it. <laughs> yeah. so. I met an Iranian guy in uh, when I was in Thailand, I don't know, seven years ago or so. And, you know, I've. It's the first Iranian person I had met, and he couldn't speak great English, but he was like very friendly and said he loves the USA and tried to carry on a conversation with me for like twenty minutes, and it was it was really cool. I mean, I think we step into that black and white thinking when you know, oh, we have a conflict with Russia. Russia is bad, and it's like the government, the government, yeah, exactly, is bad, exactly. You know? Right. The government, okay, you know, whatever, but it's like the people are very different, right? They're not, it's not the same thing. Like, think what you want about the government. It's just not, you know, we're not all a, like a, a uniform mob of anything. Like, that's yeah. not what true in America. It's not true anywhere. So, um, Persian food, by the way, I have to recommend to everybody. <laughs> Especially Persian desserts. Oh, yeah. good. So, um, but uh, it's it's just, it, it's one of those things. It's a mistake that's very common. And um, especially when it comes to like government agencies um, of the federal agencies that I know and know people in and have worked in. And I've worked in like three at this point. Everybody is just trying really hard to help people. Like every yeah. single person that I worked with, they're just trying really hard to help people. They just want, they want things to work smoothly. They want to help. They work really hard and they, they stay late. They come in early. They come in on weekends. They will do whatever they can to figure it out, to make it happen, to like not, they're not, they're not trying to make things difficult for people. They're really trying to make stuff work for people. So. You know, I, I just think it's very different. Like the language that's coming out of agencies is not the same as the, as what you hear day to day. So hmm. just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah. I mean, what is, what all is the SEC usually working on? Like they work with stocks because those are securities, obviously. Um, yes. Everything, securities, exchanges, markets, um, uh, broker dealers, uh, everything that deals with um, with uh, that basically touches securities. So um, the people who are trading securities, the, the people who list securities, um, people who are buying securities on behalf of someone, uh, information that goes to investors, information that goes out to you know other countries who want to list on our um, exchanges. Uh, if we want to list on other countries' exchanges, like um, if uh, other countries want to, um, you know, do uh, like an offering of of uh, something called 
um, an ADR, which is not really stock, but it's a representation of stock. So we have sort of a form of synthetics. So, um, you know, that kind of stuff as well. So basically anybody who's in the, uh, in the vicinity of any type of security. With, uh, with crypto specifically, there's kind of a, some unknown still, right? Because what is a security? Some cryptos, it, it's hard to tell if they're a security. And I, I think some of that's currently being addressed in, in through the court system right now with uh, different projects. Is crypto a major focus because of that for the SEC, just because they're trying to figure out how to navigate those waters? Or is it still a fairly small percentage of what's going on with the SEC? I mean, you know, crypto is a small percentage of everything. It is a big focus of the SEC. And it's kind of because um, it looks like, and this is my speculation, it looks like we made, uh, Gensler is taking this all very personally. I don't think he's ever been hated to the extent that he is mm. right now, right? I don't think yeah. he's ever in his previous positions with the CFTC or as a professor, I don't think he's ever received the kind of animosity that he is right now. And I think he's taking it very, very personally. And so it's become this focus that, um, that it would, it doesn't really warrant. And, um, and it wouldn't have been, uh, it was never intended to be, he didn't think it was going to be this kind of, when he came in, he didn't think it was going to have this kind of attention. Nobody thought it would have this kind of attention. Um, but it's because of the attacks, the personal attacks, you know, that I think, um, and, and he's not used to DGENs or things like that. You know, he's used to very refined Wall Street people, you know, professional, you know, commodities traders, things like that. He's not used to this sort of, you know, uh, you know, Wall Street traders kind of community that, um, you know, is, is, I think you suck and I'm going to tell you. And so I think that he's not, um, this is the way he's handling it. So there is a whole crypto task force. And the problem that we have right now is that um, Treasury said no new work on things until the um, there's a framework for crypto. And none of the frameworks have passed for good reason. They're crap. The presidential working group was founded, had no people from crypto in there. Uh, and all they came out with was eight reports for Treasury. That was it. And um, so so the SEC can't really make any new regulations or anything like that on there. All they can do is um, is use what they have. So it's it's a real mess right now. It's not strictly the SEC's thing even, right? Like they're not responsible for it. None of the agencies can actually do anything until there's a there's a structure. But there was this issue where they wanted to create a structure and and Gensler wasn't actually apparently helpful with the committee that was driving it. Um, he declined to be helpful. And that's not his role. He doesn't get to do that. Um, his role is actually to be the liaison between the SEC and uh, the legislature and to help them with the understand the rules of the SEC and help the SEC understand what's going on with the legislature. And so he is actually that liaison person. He doesn't have the ability to say, I'm not helping you. He also did help like a small uh, Democratic group. Apparently, this is all, you know, from people who were involved in the last set of meetings. Um and you can't be partisan about that kind of stuff. You know, he has, if he's going to be helpful, like, I mean, it, you, you can't, with respect to these laws, you can't actually just help like one side, right? I mean, you have to actually help pass these laws. So, um, so that's been, that, that was not uh, really, um, that's not been great. With respect to the, you know, is is uh, crypto a security? Like a lot of this was stupid. Uh, we picked a bad fight. Uh, the SEC's purview is telling people what a security is, right? That's their whole thing. Yeah. So we picked a bad fight. We have much better fights. Uh, we had much. We had a much better fight saying this: the regime doesn't work for us because we have this shifting asset uh, that doesn't actually have a like. We don't know if it is a um, like something that would fall 
as a um, under under uh, is it is it a gas fee? Is it a currency? Like you know, so is it a, a currency? Is it something that I would use um, uh, in order to purchase something else? Is it transactional or is it um, something that I would sell on the market or is it uh, a tax? What is it? I don't know, right? Until I sell it, and even then, I might not know what a specific coin is or a specific token until I take it to an accountant and the accountant applies the appropriate tax treatment to it. That's where you find out what a specific token was deemed. Was that one deemed a market uh, tool? Was it So was that a security or was that one deemed used for the transfer? Because I have no idea if I buy, you know, ETH, uh, you know, in January, February and March, then I used some, you know, in April for a market transaction. And I used also another group for to buy an NFT. And then some of it paid for the uh, gas for that NFT purchase. Then how do I know which ETH was used for what? No. I didn't know when I bought it, what I was going to use it for. I had no idea. And when I sold it, I still don't know which thing was used for what, because uh, historically, every single security has had a static a static value, right? A static uh, utility, right? It, it is a security. Like Apple stock remains Apple stock. Even if you use it to buy something else, it's just an asset that you're using to buy something else. It doesn't turn into a currency. No. Apple stock is Apple stock is Apple stock is Apple stock. It's not suddenly cash. It's not suddenly, you know, paying, uh, you know, uh, like a, a, a tax or phone fee or something like that. It's it's still Apple stock. You might be able to trade it for something, but it's Apple stock forever until until Apple stock is fully liquidated. It's still Apple stock. Debt yeah. is debt is debt is debt is debt forever. It can only be one thing unless you cash it out, right? It can only be one thing. Tokens aren't like that. So the whole system doesn't work for us, right? So this is the whole issue is the system doesn't work for us. That's a much better argument then is it a security or is it not a security? Like this is a stupid argument. We picked an argument in the playground that this agency owns and has owned for a hundred years. It's a stupid argument, right? Yeah. It was a stupid argument. So all of that, I don't care about. It doesn't matter what they say, you know, and they can't even tell me if I buy something that it's, uh, that it is that thing when I buy it, because it might not be that thing when I sell it. It might not be that thing when I, when I purchased it. I might not have determined what I want to do with it. Right. I right. might not know when I sell it what it is. It might be something completely different. And we've never had that before. So it actually combines several different agencies together. And so we need a new regime for it. We do have several different, um, rules that are coming out. The problem is all of them kind of regard crypto differently. So we need a little bit of conformity for that. Yeah. When I watched uh, Gary Gensler's MIT lecture series around uh, blockchain technology, I made some assumptions about how he was going to approach things when he stepped into that uh, chair role for the SEC. And I, I feel like I was thrown off with the direction that he actually went with certain things. Do you feel like his prerogatives were hard to predict in that sense? Yes and no. I mean, on one hand, look, when he said that stuff, crypto was different. Like a lot of that, you know, look, when he was saying stuff from 2015 to 2018, it was a different world, right? I mean, crypto has changed very quickly. You can't expect him in, you know, the post 2020 world to have the same view of crypto that he did, you know, in 2017. When in 2017, there wasn't a slew of retail investors, right? It was yeah. still a bunch of basically elite people who were investing in crypto. It was a bunch of people who were in CS and finance, right? That was the industry for the most part. People were like, why are you in such a male dominated industry? It's like, because it's a bunch of people who are in computer science and finance and those are extremely male dominated industries. That's yeah. who came into crypto. And that was it for a long time. And then 2020, when people were losing jobs and people were at home all the time, that's when people started taking interest in, in crypto and we had a much broader base and the risks seemed different, right? So um, on one hand, yeah, I mean, he also had a very different idea of what crypto was, but maybe we all did. 
Um, he had a different idea of the potential risk of it. Like the fact that he didn't actually see what was coming. He didn't see the potential risk for retail investors. That's weird to me, right? Yeah. Because it was happening back then. But he, I don't know if he didn't regard it. He didn't see it. Uh, I don't know if he didn't know what was happening. Because remember, I mean, uh, I mean, I got in in 2016. I was telling people right away, like, look, man, you guys are, you know, you guys are going to have some trouble here. We were doing the stupid SAFT thing, which is not legal. And we were doing all these, you know, clearly, you know, like securities transactions, fundraisings for, for you know, chains that didn't exist or whatever. And I was like, how can people say this is not legal? <laughs> this is all legal. Like, this is not legal. Yeah. You know, and so then we had a huge lawsuit that nearly brought down a huge firm. And it was like this giant thing. And, uh, and for someone to say like, you know, this is all awesome and there's no problem here. That would be someone who would be blind to it. Right. So for him not to recognize at, uh, early on that there was a problem, I think, uh, is significant. But for him to say it was a different world, then I think is true. It was a different world, right? We did not have nearly the number of people involved. We didn't have nearly the same retail risk. We didn't have nearly the same number of scams. The scams that we had were obvious, right? People yeah. were talking about the kind of scams. We had like $2 million in losses or whatever in scams, whatever, drop in the bucket. But the scams were like, you know, the fuck you coin and stuff like that. You know, there were like these obvious things that were like, you know, people were like, I don't know what's going to happen with that. I'm going to throw money in it anyway. I don't care. I know the guy who's yeah. doing it. And so I'm just going to throw cash in. So, you know, it was just, it was different. It was different. Yeah. I, I looked up once and I, apparently there was a, a scam coin called scam at one point, which is kind of wild that people, it's, it's crazy that some people end up buying some of these coins that are just obviously scams. Um, but, I know. What are the uh, what are the ongoing lawsuits uh, going on that people should be aware of, and where do you see them going? Not that you can predict the future, but where do you think they're at, and where do you think they're going? Um. So, I mean, there's a lot. Like, so Binance looks kind of over. I don't know that any there's going to be any uh, private lawsuits on that one. Uh, CZ wins totally, uh, hands down. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, four months and it was like, what, a billion dollars that was paid by the, the exchange didn't bat an eye, you know, and for that, what he got rid of SBF he, and, and the FTX threat, he got huge amounts of market share. He got infinitely richer. He, uh, you know, he expanded his reach and, uh, and what happened, you know, he got four months in like, you know, Mick jail. <laughs> it's not yeah. going to be like anything terrible. Uh, you know, maybe he'll learn art or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> he'll learn, he'll learn a new craft. <laughs> he'll come out like buff <laughs> ripped yeah. from jail, but, uh, like nothing, you know, he definitely won that one. There's the consensus case. Um, that one is, uh, is an interesting one. Mostly in that one, what I'm interested in is there's a lot of accusations of, you know, the SEC, I think, looking into a lot of people who were involved in the Ethereum offering, which I would want to know. You know, there's just accusations, right? Like they're asking people who, when, where, like they called us, when, to who, who called, who, who, who spoke with you? Like, I want to know that stuff because... That uh, they're way past the statute of limitations on the original offering. So, what exactly are they asking about? You know, what are they what are they looking at for the original offering of Ethereum? Uh, you know, the the original ETH drop, right? So, I'm not sure. Um, uh, the rest of the consensus argument isn't very strong, unfortunately. I did a whole breakdown of it uh, on a space, and it's recorded if you want to hear it. Let's see. What are the other uh, cases that are going on right now? I'm trying to think. Is a Ripple one? Is that still ongoing? Uh, well, Ripple was finished from the lower court. That was the Torres decision that came down. 
we have to see if the SEC is going to uh, is going to appeal. Uh, so it was actually deemed a security on one count, and then two the you know they were the SEC did not win, but that one count does actually mean that there that it's a security, and so the SEC asked for like this enormous fine that they're probably not going to get, um, but. It, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, people are asking whether or not, you know, if you do an offering, a secondary offering on an exchange, does that count as, you know, an offering? You know, there's nothing clear on that right now. We don't have anything clearly that tells you that that is or is not acceptable. So I wouldn't use that as any sort of, um, you know, ruling. And remember, Ripple only applies to the district in which it w- the ruling was made. So it's not like it's a universal decision. And we have already opposing rulings. So, so that, I mean, but that's still going on. We don't know what's going to happen otherwise. It looks like uh, there's no rush right now for the Ethereum ETFs to happen uh, for, you know, spot market ETFs to happen. There was this idea that maybe they would happen right away, but uh, probably not because they're now saying, well, there's this issue of whether or not uh, uh, ETH is going to be declared a security versus uh, um, a commodity or anything like that. And, you know, I don't know. I, I doubt that ETH is going to be declared um, a, a security, uh, but what would be the real issue, right? The issue is really about um, not necessarily uh, that initial drop. It's really about all of the exchanges, all of the different transition points, where people access all of these. Those are the ones, and most of them are centralized, right? Those are the places that are actually going to be impacted by this. So. Uh, there's the Uniswap case that's coming right now. That people think is going to be so different because it's a DEX. But the truth is it's actually centralized. It's owned primarily, I think, by Binance and A16Z. So, so it's not like it's not a centralized entity. It's not just code that's released on a platform. Like it may be executed that way, but it's owned by, you know, at least two majority entities. So, so, you know, I think that that isn't going to come out the way people think it is. The idea, though, that a DEX can't exist is totally false um, because we have those in stocks, right? We're allowed to make markets of things without the issuer. And, uh, and that is, you know, the 15C211 market that you can do between brokers. You can do that. So you can have brokers who don't talk to an issuer, who just decide that they want to make a market in a particular stock. And they do. And uh, and that's pretty much the same thing as a DEX. But remember, all of this right now, uh, we have a bunch of new regulations coming in from Treasury that have been sitting on their desk, but we're obligated to take on. And that's going to change the nature of like all of this stuff. So, you know, everything, DEXs and MSBs, all they're all going to be regulated you know, it's it's all going to change. All of this stuff is kind of like last gasps of this current, you know, regulatory scheme. Did they ever end up sentencing SBF or is they that did. still on? They did. Uh, they did. He, he got sentenced. What is it like? Uh, I want to say 20 years, something like that. He got okay. way worse than... Then CZ, there's, I guess, some statement that CZ may have turned on someone to get that sentence. Yeah. But what's interesting is who? Who who could he have information about that they would cut down from rough like 20 years or more, right? Because it's way bigger than FTX ever was. There's probably way more evidence of wrongdoing than, you know, FTX ever had. Who? Who would he have turned on? What kind of information would he have had? Who, like, I'm, I'm not doubting that he would have it. I'm just saying who, who would, who did they want information on where they're like, CZ, he's not the big guy. Someone else is bigger, right? Someone else has more information. And so, you know, I, I have a suspicion of who he gave information about, but, but, and that's probably why he, you know, he got out of it, but 
We'll see. The you saying that CZ there was more evidence of wrongdoing. That kind of surprises me because, I mean, when you look at what happened with FTX versus Binance, uh, FTX was, I mean, they screwed over a lot of people. A lot of people lost a lot of money thinking that their assets were safe. And then with Binance, I, I haven't really heard of that too much. I thought it with CZ, it was more allegations of uh, like money laundering like or facilitating money laundering, stuff like that. Yeah, which is still very serious, but also there was a lot of apparently, apparently there was evidence that he was involved in all the stuff with with FTX, right? Because mm, he and SBF yeah. were, you know, involved together. SBF saved him when he, you know, was uh, when there were a bunch of jurisdictions turning against him. Um, they were uh, they were collaborating for the most part, right? So a lot of those charges should also have implicated CZ. He also uh, it wasn't just the um, you know, tax evasion and the, um, you know, he apparently he had been aiding and abetting criminals in being able to not just launder money, but basically, I mean, there was some speculation apparently that they were able to, you know, he was enabling crime. So, yeah. you know, on that's like more an Interpol thing. And that's the kind of thing that is actually, uh, you know, worse than financial crime is, you know, physical crime. So, you know, there's all this sort of, it's all speculation. I don't have evidence of any of that stuff, but apparently there was. So I don't know. But, uh, you know, certainly more than four months worth, right? So the real question is, where's, you know, what are we going to hear about that, you know, where's that, that hammer going to drop next, right? Because that's really what we're looking at is someone else is getting in trouble for this. And I just want to see that, you know, so. Because who would let CZ go as a result, yeah. right? Who would, who would, after all this time, after all of the money spent on the prosecutions, after him, like basically, you know, someone saying, hey, you know, we're, we're creating an, an illegal uh, securities exchange, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, after all that, you know, to let him go with four months is just kind of, um, there's something. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to watch it play out. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the banking industry, which has a lot of power in politics in the U S and, and worldwide, I would say. How, how much influence is the banking industry having over regulation? Like I know there are politicians in Congress that have a lot more, the banking industry has a lot more influence over some more than others. Although I would say it's a lot over most. Do you feel like that's going to factor in a lot over where things go in the future? Does the banking industry have influence over politics? For sure. For sure. I mean, basically, we've been in this dance since roughly 1913 or so, uh, trying to create some form of Glass-Steagall, right? All banks have to operate in this very controlled manner. And then a bunch of banks saying, accept us, right? So yeah. they put together these groups for various reasons, and then they pick away at that law, so much so that the law is meaningless. And then some disaster happens. We have a banking disaster and a recession, and the law gets reinstated over and over and over. People think Glass-Steagall was the first time. No, we do this over and over. Why? You know, like, look, and even the bank failures now, that's a re direct result of the lobbying started like the guy who led that lobby, the guy who ran Silicon Valley Bank, right? Mm. He ran that lobby saying, we're just a tiny little bank who basically owns most of the VC and uh, startup money. That's what we have. But we're yeah. a tiny, insignificant bank. We shouldn't be under this rule. And and that's the thing is like they 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 feel like 
they have the money to do what they want. So they, they do what they want. And so they form these lobbies and they pay people off. And I have a whole issue with so with just the concept of lobbies is so wrong because uh, when you're an elected official, all you are is a proxy. You have said, I'm going to vote this way on these things. Yeah. If other things come up that haven't been predetermined, I I'm going to vote in this tendency. And if it is going to be different, I will clear it with you, right? But this is how I plan on voting. And the people vote and they say, okay, this is how I want to vote. All you are is a proxy. That's it. You don't have a vote to sell. It's not your vote. It's the constituency's vote. So all of these elected officials should be telling these lobbyists, I'm not the person you should be talking to. Go take your shit that you want to sell me or give me or whatever for my vote. Go take it to the constituency. Give it all to them. If it changes their mind, great. I'll change my vote. If it doesn't, oh, well, right? That's what you should be doing. And because there's nothing that the person who is actually voting gets to do like that. It's not that person's vote. They act like they're the person who gets to, to decide, but they don't get to decide. They're just acting on behalf of other people. So this whole concept is based on this idea that the bankers are just basically offering a shit ton of money to these elected officials for their yeah. votes that they're not supposed to be able to offer. Right. So there, I mean, this whole system is just so broken that, uh, you know, on one hand, I'm like, you know, stupid bankers offering this stuff. And on the other hand, it's like, well, ugh, stupid elected officials taking it. They're not supposed to take it. Right. Like it shouldn't work. Anyway, so this is what keeps happening, this cycle over and over again. People get paid off, and then this whole this law that is supposed to protect all the depositors gets holes and holes and holes in it until it falls apart. And then something disastrous happens, and the taxpayers get screwed because we have to pay for it. And then another law comes out, and then we recycle the whole thing over and over again. Yeah, I mean, a lot. Of, I, I'm a, with you 100% with... Uh, lobbyists should not have the influence that they do. I can see lobbying for certain, I don't even know if I want to say that, but certain causes you want to have the voices heard. But like you said, it should go to the constituents and they should be the ones that then go to pressure the politicians. But I think in our current landscape, I, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but lobbyists often write legislation. And they, they just basically hand the legislation over and say, this is the bill. This is the bill that we want you to pass. And I doubt the politicians have read it because most of those bills are hundreds, if not thousands of pages. And I doubt most of them are sitting there going through every line of, of that legislation. So it's, it's quite a distortion of what our country was supposed to be as far as legislation is concerned, in my opinion. So I agree. I find it all very upsetting. So, but yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, it's very unfortunate. You touched on this in an interview I listened to, but there's actually an industry as far as certain nation states as with regard to financial crime. I mean, you look at uh, countries like Iran, uh, believe Russia might be in that list and then North Korea, I'd imagine. How does that factor into the crypto world? Because, I mean, people have gotten their funds or their crypto stolen by North Korean hackers, Russian hackers, different nation states. It might not be directly the nation state, but the nation state that those actors are from typically benefit from those crimes. I mean, for sure, there's all there's always like suites of uh, people who are um, from these uh, countries who run banks of of hackers and bots and stuff like that. I mean, that we know that happens, and it is what it is on um, to a large extent, right? Um, how does that impact crypto? Um, you know, a lot of ways. On one hand. You know, we have a lot of people who sell misinformation a lot of in a lot of ways, right? Uh, to to people like to legislators and stuff like that about crypto that can that harms us. 
we have a lot of people who who work to manipulate prices and things like that as well. But uh, the issue of having financial havens is the whole reason that this new set of regulations is disappearing. Because it used to be that having financial crime havens was fine. People were okay with that. Uh, basically, you know, they considered financial crime better than physical crime, you know, like traditional, like blue collar crime or whatever. And so essentially um, a jurisdiction would uh, get a benefit from having criminals in their jurisdiction. Some, some countries got a huge percentage of their GDP from housing these criminals, right? So like Libya used to make a ton of money from it. And uh, there are other countries that basically will just protect and support, a, you know, like financial criminals. They just have like more lax rec, uh, la lax rules. And with a certain amount of money, you can come in, they'll, they'll give you citizenship, they'll protect you, you know, whatever. And, and so the whole thing about this change of rules is that everybody essentially has the same regulatory structure. So there's no jurisdiction shopping. And there won't be any safe havens. That's the whole point is to prevent these safe havens. And to that extent, you know, to the extent that we all have conformity in these rules, not only are there not these, these safe havens for criminals, but there's also not judicial safe havens, right? So the idea of like leaving a country because it has unfavorable rules and moving to another country you know, theoretically that will end because there's not going to be a net benefit for being in that other country because it will have sub substantively the same rules as the other jurisdictions. So if nothing else, there should be some level of predictability, right, over everything else. So that's, I mean, that's something, but, um, but that's kind of where things are going because right now it's, you know, you're forced to create this patchwork uh, of companies essentially to uh, maximize the the protections of these various jurisdictions and various pieces, but um, you know hopefully you won't have to do that in the future. I don't know that that's going to be a hundred percent true, but you know hopefully it'll be better. When it comes to crypto being stolen by uh, hackers, whatever it might be. Uh, Atomic Wallet is one example I can think of in the last couple of years that somebody got let in the back door or something like that and people stole the money or stole the crypto. I've heard somebody speculate that quantum computing is already at the point where the federal government can get crypto back, but I don't I don't see any evidence of that. Is and and you're into quantum computing. Is that a reality or is it still not quite there. No, they're not there. Quantum computing isn't going to help with retrieving stolen stuff, right? It's going to help move things faster, right? So you won't have log jams. Um, it's going to help with encryption and decryption. And, uh, and, and basically um, being able to scale. That's what it's going to help with a lot but it's not about retrieving stuff. So that's more about identity and being able to, to take away anonymity when, uh, when someone has abused it. And that's uh, one thing that still has to happen. The other thing is we have to, we have to have jurisdictions that will allow individuals to be able like to prosecute people with insufficient information so there's like a limited amount of what they call John Doe prosecutions right where you have like a wallet you know and like well it had a you know a kitty nft in it that was basically all i know about it but you don't actually you know the thing is also it will it has the ability to you know move so it could like move things out of that wallet into another wallet. And does that, you know, now that new wallet, does that mean that you can no longer find the assets there? So um, primarily the best way to 
to grab theft, to, to control theft is what the exchanges do, which is when they get stolen from, they, they contact all the other exchanges and notify them immediately of the wallet. Right. So the wallet doesn't get to exchange it anywhere else and move into another wallet. The wallet's screwed. And that's a lot of what happened with the theft of like the Bitcoin and a bunch of ETH and stuff like that. That's what happens. But they don't do that for other people. They do it for themselves. So a jurisdiction that would force essentially exchanges to freeze uh, an identified wallet, like an APB kind of thing, right? Freeze the identified wallet so it didn't conduct any transactions or face liability if it did. Um, that would help a lot in terms of theft. And then being able to uh, force identification, like you don't get the protection of anonymity when you're using it as a weapon, not as a shield, then um, being able to force identification of uh, wallet holders, which is what happened in the UK with that world of women theft, that actually is another thing that will help with recovery. But the government as a like on the whole, the government is farther behind the, um, you know, the rest of the industry. It's not usually leading the game in the industry. Like the, the only reason that they got a bunch of the Bitcoin from the colonial pipeline theft, uh, you know, a ransom is because one of the uh, one of the places that they raided where the criminals had just been, the, the criminal left his wallet open, like left his account open on the computer. Gotcha. And so they were able to access that account. Okay. Uh, so they got half the coins back. <laughs> but it was not because they were like, we are so smart, we got it. It's because literally the, the guy didn't, didn't log out of his account. So... That makes sense. I mean, that's what I thought it was something just a human thing. Like they either got the person to give them the seed phrases or, or something like that. Like I, I didn't think quantum computing was being used to actually retrieve any funds at this point. And, um, does quantum computing pose a threat to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as I've heard mentioned? I mean, a lot of people are terrified of it because they think it'll break all the encryption. You know, the truth is that quantum computing is a much better uh, defensive technology than offensive technology. Remember that, you know, every time people try to make, you know, keys with uh, with quantum computing, people are just going to make locks with quantum computing, right? Yeah. Like that's really what's going to happen is that, uh, the locks and the chains are going to have quantum layers on them. That's where we're going to end up. And so it's going to be essentially the same technology fighting itself. So I think that the fear that people have that it's going to destroy everything, you know, to the extent that we have proof of stake technologies, those are going to be the easiest ones, I think, to uh, add a quantum layer to, right? We'll call it like, you know, an L3 or for, um, for layer, for chains like, uh, like I think it's called Celestia that has like modded layers where they have like individual mods that you can actually move around and apply in other ways. They'll have another layer that's like the, qu the quantum layer, the quantum secure, they'll call it like the security layer or something like that. Yeah. And, and that'll just be added into all these other ones. And what it'll do is basically like allow you to randomly shift through the different layers. So it's unpredictable. And that's actually just going to allow uh, a lot more security. So when I say that it's like better defensively than offensively is that anything that you can do to attack it, you can do equally to protect it. So, and the protecting it, you can do in advance, <laughs> right? So you can do more in advance to protect whatever layer you're working with than than, you know, the attack part of it. So I think it's going to be the same sort of issue as current technology, right? Which is there will be people who will be building stuff and they'll leave back doors in and we can't protect against that. And where there'll be people who will be, you know, you know, who are using, uh, you know, some, you know, like phishing technology or whatever. It doesn't matter if there's quantum computing in there or not. There won't need to be, right? Because people click on links. Don't click on links, right? So uh, like that kind of stuff is just going to happen. But I don't think that it's like this horrible disaster or whatever. Like that's not, that's not the issue, right? It's, it's not about uh, quantum computing, like destroying things. It's really just another layer that just gets added in and it's going to make all of it so much faster and more scalable. 
And it's actually going to help, I think, a lot with the processing between different chains. So, but that's just what I think is going to happen. So, awesome. Um, you're uh, you're also an advisor for, or you're a founder and an advisor for for startups and things like that. And this has some. It's a little personal of a question for me, but what's your advice for people who are looking into my tech startups that aren't coders? You know, how how do people navigate those waters in your opinion? Like to become a tech star- a tech founder? Yeah, yeah, somebody has an idea uh of a a software company, but they don't have the coding background to develop it themselves. How do how do you recommend people navigate those waters? I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it now. There's so many low code options, no code options. Now, remember the security on low and no code options is negligible, right? So, um, cause they're using essentially like cookie cutter parts. So, uh, just know that you're basically building, you know, something that is your, your MVP or your beta test. You are not building your final model, right? You're going to have to get people who actually know how to code. You can't build your final model on a no or low code solution. That is something to remember. If, if, you're, primary, if you're primarily working on something that is tech-based, your tech core cannot be on a low or no code solution. It will fail. They're not designed for that. No. But it will help you build your prototype. It will help you sell your idea to people who can build it, right? So remember that you have to build a team, even though we're talking about like, oh, you can have a billion dollar company, you know, with just one person. Those are not people who are building a billion dollar company uh, that's a scalable tech company with no tech skill. That's not uh, that's not what we're talking about here. So you're going to need to build a, a company. Don't outsource your tech because it will cost you more in the end and you won't control it. So start building with with the tools that are available. And then you have to convince someone with the tech skills to build it that what you're doing uh, is better than whatever it is that they're doing. As, as their side, they all have side projects yeah. that better than their side project, better than their, you know, whatever company they want to found or whatever it is that what you're doing has more potential, is better, is more fun, is more exciting, has has more future than whatever it is that they're um, that they're doing. And that's your first sales job is convincing that tech person. Now, remember, you have to offer some core skills. If you don't have core skills that you are offering, then you this is not the company for you to found, right? You have to make sure that there's also a fit between the, the product that you're creating and, uh, and you as a founder. There should be a reason why you are a founder of this particular solution. You're solving a problem and you're the person that should solve this problem. So it may be that you're not the one building the product, but there's something else that you're offering that's core to this particular project. And that's why you're here. So make sure that that exists. For most things that won't exist, right? There There are very few things that founders must be the founder to build. That's product founder fit, right? There are very few things that fit that category. Most things, you could build it, but so could anyone else. You have no competitive advantage in building it. You should not build those, right? That's, there's no reason why you should be the person to build it. Then you should not build those. There's a lot of great ideas and great solutions that people come up with. I have a whole book of all the different solutions that I look at. And I'm like, these are all things that need to be made. But most of them I'll never make because I'm not the founder that has a competitive advantage in that particular solution. I see it. I see that it needs to be made. I see that it solves a problem. I see that it has a huge market share, et cetera. But I don't have a reason to be the founder of that particular company. I just happen to think of it. But having the idea is insufficient. No. How do you you advise people on determining whether their idea is worth bringing to the table? That's a whole discussion. Um, That's a, that's a pretty long one. You know, the first and first and foremost, it needs to solve a problem, 
But um, there are a lot of reasons why people would have something. They would solve a problem with something, right? There's a lot of, there's a, or, the, or they would bring a product to market. There's a lot of reasons why people do that. Uh, so it's more like a case by case basis. But the first thing is, are you solving a problem? Like that's the first easiest, easiest hurdle is, are you solving a problem? But, um, but generally speaking, that's kind of a case by case thing. Yeah. So you, you hold a pitch space where you, you let people pitch their ideas. Uh, where should people be in their ideas to come to your space and actually present their ideas? Should they have a minimum viable product? Should they? have a business plan or, and, and people are worried in coming to those kind of things of like, Hey, if I say this in an open space, that's a recorded space. Will my idea be stolen? You know, like what should people consider when they're pitching something? Okay. Well, um, so I bring investors in, so, um, you should be at the point of being ready to have an investor, which means you should have traction. You should have proven that your product has a market ready, willing, and able to buy your product. Most people aren't there, um, but some are, and that's great. They've gotten funded. And talking about your idea in public is not really, you know, the thing that people think it is, right? Already, I can guarantee most everybody who's working on something, there's like, you know, 50 other people working on the exact same issue doing the exact same thing, right? It's all about execution. Your idea is fundamentally meaningless. It is not about what you thought of. It's really about, uh, can you make it happen? How are you making it happen? What is the answer that you came up with? And uh, are people buying that answer, right? So that's, that's, that's most of it. And most people have, like almost everybody has ideas. But most people can't do anything with those. They can't get anybody. They can't make it real. And even if they do make it real, they can't get anybody to buy it. Yeah. So th that's the big hurdle for most people. So it doesn't really matter that you're saying stuff. Now, that said, don't talk about anything confidential in a public space. There's no reason to. We would never ask you to. If anybody does, then, you know, say like, you know, I don't think I should be talking about that. So but. Don't talk about like pub, like non-public information in a public space. Don't talk about trade secrets or things like that. We don't ask for any of that information. You don't need it. There's not no reason for it. This is about uh, building relationships with investors. So that's it. What do you feel like? Well, so I was uh, talking to uh, an entrepreneur yesterday in a space and his take was your the likelihood of you going to an investor that you don't know and getting them to give you money is basically zero and so do people know. actually have a uh, sorry what go ahead sorry do people actually have a chance of getting an investor interested if they don't have a relationship with that investor at all well the whole point is to build the relationship with the investors that's what you're doing like i started off and even though okay so i was a lawyer that I worked with a ton of companies and I had, um, I'd worked with banks, I'd worked with uh, major investors, I'd worked with, you know, startups and advanced companies. I'd worked with all of them and I thought I knew a lot about business. I was wrong. And, um, and I, it, but I didn't feel like I could go to them for money. I don't know why, uh, in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have felt that way, but I did. So uh, I felt like I had no connections whatsoever. I started from zero, but I built those connections. And that's what the space is all about, is really about building the relationships. I talk a lot about how to go to events and meet people and build these relationships with people over time, what you're saying, how long you're saying it, what you're doing next, how you follow up, what you say in your follow-up, all of that stuff so that you understand how to build these connections over time. Because that's really what you're doing. So, so is it true that you're going to get money from people you don't know? I guess that's true because who's, you know, that means you're like, what, you walk up to somebody on the street, tell them what you do, and they hand you a check for a million dollars? Yes, that doesn't happen. Yeah. But are you going to get money from people that, you know, you, you don't know well or, or, you know, you 
you, someone introduced you to them, you don't know them, but someone introduced you and they hand you a check. That's happened to me lots of times, right? I was, I got angel and VC funding and I didn't have like close relationships with any of those people. I was introduced to everybody um, over time. And then they asked me to come pitch to them and that's how it happened. That's how I got money. But it was not like I had, you know, I didn't have a school relationship that I built from, you know, like, oh, well, you know, well, you know, look at us. We were in the same like, you know, Yale club or whatever. We weren't in that. I didn't have that. Uh, I didn't have like, you know, the same address or same, you know, our parents knew each other or, you know, I grew up rich and here's our, you know, the, we went to the same like, uh, what do they call them? Preparatory schools. Like we didn't go to the same prep school. Uh -huh. You know, I'm like, you know, I didn't have any of that stuff. So, so you will build those relationships and by the time you need that money or you get to that level, um, they will know you well enough to know whether or not they want to fund you. But, you know, it's not going to happen from a stranger, but yeah, it, you don't have to be best friends with them. They're not people you had to go to school with or whatever. You just have to learn how to build those relationships. And it sucks. I'm an introvert. I, I hated it the whole yeah. time. I still hate it. So what are the events that you recommend people start going to like the in-person events? I mean, I, I say like anything, right. Anything that's a target rich environment. So that's like basically, you know, conferences that are in your area that are in your industry that have like potential co-founders or potential investors or whatever you want the high level ones, right. It's better to go to a great one that you have to pay for than to a general low level one that's free, right? That's just, yeah. I think, probably a given, but just in case I want to tell people like that's what you want to do. And you want to go to like, I mean, the parties that are around them, parties and events, you know, talk to the people in the uh, lobby and in the, you know, going up and down the hallways. Like, I met people when I spoke at a web summit, I met people all, all over the place and the, like they put all the speakers in the same hotel. So I met tons of people just in the hotel, right? So target rich environment, you got to talk to people, you know, all around a venue, basically all of those people. And then at those events themselves. And then um, like for me, I only go to events now where I'm speaking because uh, it's overwhelming for me to go to a lot of events. I have kids, uh, so it's not as easy for me to just pick up and go to a random event. But also, um, I find large events really overwhelming. Uh, so uh, I'm so uncomfortable that it's much easier if I'm speaking and people come up to me and start talking. Um, that's just more comfortable for me. Yeah. But until you're in that place... Uh, just go to the events and start talking to people. And that's literally what I teach in the, the pitch spaces. And I have this quick pitch method. And the method is literally how you answer the question, what do you do? It's free off my site. Like you can go get it. You can like read it, how it works. I created it. <laughs> like it's just from the study of psychology. And it's literally how to answer this in a short, concise way. So people who might be interested in what you're doing will, will show you that they're interested and you can actually start a relationship from there. That's all it is, is basically understanding how to answer the question. I just took a question that people always ask. It's more asked than what's your name more is, is what do you do? <laughs> so I took, what do you do? Which someone is going to ask you somewhere in line somewhere. And you answer that question. And that is literally how you start building relationships. Awesome. I always love to ask people about books because I love reading. Now, what are some books that you found influential and beneficial in your life? And uh, they could be books or res resources that you recommend to people. Um, so a lot of them, my goodness, um, in a bunch of different ways. I, I read like uh, anything. I don't really have a, like I only read this author. I only read this type of, you know, this genre or whatever. Um, so my book, yay, was great. But uh, I like The Wealth and Poverty of Na Nations by David Landis, I thought was really interesting. It's a very interesting study of how people work. And um, I like, you know, why people buy. I like, gosh, there's a lot of different books. 
I mean, like everything, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is a great book. I, there's like, I don't really know what kind of books. Uh, um, I don't really have like a, at the top of my list of what um, I think that Vitalik's book on blockchain was great. I just think he's an amazing writer and thinker. Uh, I don't always agree with him, but I think, you know, whatever he reads is worth reading. Whatever he writes is worth reading. He's got a great analytic framework to work from. I like Benjamin Graham. Uh, what What is it? The uh, uh, the Intelligent Investor, I think, is what he wrote. And I don't know. There's a lot of stuff, I guess. Uh, I read a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is uh, one of my best friends. He recommends that. I have it sitting on my shelf over here. I got to read it. It's so, a great book. It's a great yeah. book. So I read it years ago. I still love it. I mean, God, there's so many books I could recommend, um, but in so many different genres. I I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, there's like, I'm looking at my bookshelves. There's like, I'm looking at like, in right in this room, I've got about 200 books that I've read. These are like my favorite ones. So I read them like many, many times. So I could probably tell you about some of those, but they're not necessarily like, they're not crypto books. They're like more, they're like, some of them are business. Some of them are philosophy. Some of them are, you know, there's a few like, you know, action like oh my god uh what is this ken follow book the lie down with lions oh that was a great book that's one that makes you want to travel to afghanistan honestly mm. it was such a yeah. good book right there's like all sorts of god i have a lot of books i should read these again too there's just a lot like uh oh um uh guns germs and steel fabulous book um oh there's like this set of books that I got from Quora. I don't know if you know Quora. Quora is like this uh, question yeah. and answer site uh, that I used to be on all the time. And I used, was top writer for all the years that I was like an active writer on there. And and then they got rid of the program. But we used to get all these like goodies uh, when we were top, when they had the top writer program. All the top writers got goodies. And one year we got this set of books that was like uh, a lot of like they'd selected some of the top writer answers in there. And it's actually a really fun little, little like set of books to like actually see what they picked out. So that's a fun set. No. So I don't know. There's like, I don't know. This is a terrible question for me. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I, I like everything. No, I like, I, I'm the, I'm the same way. I read a little bit of everything and uh, it is a hard question to answer when you're a bibliophile, like when you really like reading and people are like, what, what books? It's like, well, these are the ones on my mind right now, but these aren't all the ones that I like. So yeah, not an easy question. I know. All right. Well, uh, Alexandra, I really appreciate your time today. And before we wrap up, I want to give you an opportunity to tell listeners where they can find you, learn more about you, where they can find your book. I will have a, I'll put a link for your book in the show notes of the podcast when we release the episode. Anything else you want to share today as well? Um... I guess uh, the pitch space is on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific on X. And then I usually do an educational space on Tuesdays uh, at 10 a.m. on X. Um, and what else? Uh, you can reach me. My email is alex at alexdamsker.com. And what else? I don't know. I speak at events. I think I'll be at Consensus. I'll be speaking there and I'll have books there. I think they're, I'm doing a book signing there, I think. And I don't really know. And then the book is on Amazon. And I think you can get it off the O'Reilly platform. I'm not really clear on all this stuff because I don't really do anything else. Like I wrote it. Now I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Except in like another month, I have to turn in my first edit. So it's like every three months it has to be updated. And then every year they put out a new edition. Yeah. So I, I, there's already changes that I want to put in. So I'm like, I'll never be done. <laughs> so uh, there's more. There's always going to be more. But um, I don't know. And, and if you're interested in hiring me as a consultant, um, you know, you can always schedule a free 15 minute call, like a discovery call through LinkedIn. Awesome. So I do. I don't know. I work with a lot of different types of companies and. 
I solve a lot of problems. <laughs> I really do. I mean, in like super quickly. So I don't know. Uh, it's really fun. And uh, I will I will make the world like more open for you. Like it's very weird, but I mean, you're like, you'll you'll be you'll be happy. <laughs> you'll yeah. be happy. You'll be very excited about what you can do. Because um, I find most people don't think big enough about where their future is. And so we can figure out like new revenue streams and new ways to do what you want to do and be where you want to be. And so like people get very excited and I'm like, this is the future. <laughs> this is yeah. where it is. So yeah. uh, okay. anyway, that's all. I don't have anything else. Alexandra, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It was absolutely a pleasure. Thanks very much for asking. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to fractalzoo.net where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing, each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience. So find me on Twitter or X at RDTM podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.